Combating this pandemic has become more than a global issue. It's an existential fight for our mutual future. And although we come from very different professions, I learned very quickly just how much further the world could progress based on collaboration and sharing mentality. Progress is so much faster when national interests are set aside and commercial concerns are shelved for the greater good. And that is the spirit in which this conference is convened. We have drawn together an international faculty of leading clinicians to distill the evidence and consider the lessons learned from the respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurological responses to COVID-19. We're fortunate to be able to draw on leading experts from North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Not to mention the thousands of attendant clinicians that we welcome from every corner of the world. Our shared ambition is to learn the lessons of COVID-19, lessons that we are still learning today in order that we can minimize the impact of future waves of the disease or plan more effectively for other pandemics. In order to understand more about the medical aspects of this pandemic, we were in communication with physicians who were deployed to Wuhan. We have multiple academic and clinical collaborations with physicians in Wuhan, specifically from the West China Hospital in Chengdu. We set up a teleconference with physicians who had been deployed to Wuhan in February of 2020, where we learned several key aspects from their observations. Am I personal experience was, I would say, difficult, strange, because I was here in Barcelona. I was receiving emails and chats from my colleagues in Italy. Something really scary, people trying to invent new ventilators, filters, trying to get protected, people dying everywhere, no beds. So the first shot was really, really tremendous. And while I was here, I do remember my main uh, uh, duty was to try to inform other colleagues here in Spain about the fear about, you know, the risks we, are, we were as close country. So I do remember on one week I was uh, looking for ventilators to send to Italy. To Italy was des Italian's colleagues, Italian colleagues were desperate to receive 500 uh, ventilators. After about 10 days, we were looking for ventilators here in Spain.
I think we still don't know which technique is is best for each person, whether it's CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. There is a recovery RS trial uh, in progress in the UK, a sister trial to the recovery uh, drug therapeutic trial, uh, which will help us know which particular phenotypes would benefit. In terms of the cardiovascular system, there's no doubt that COVID-19 represents an important challenge. We've seen that not only in terms of uh, the frequency of, of uh, cardiovascular events, the importance of comorbidities that drive poor cardiovascular outcome also being associated with poor outcome for patients infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But also this very interesting phenomenon of uh, quite profound and distributed uh, anatomically intravascular thrombosis, both in small vessels and in larger vessels. And certainly for the small vessel disease, uh, the view that we are now dealing with three manifestations of thrombosis. Uh, traditional arterial thromboembolic events, which manifest as myocardial infarction and stroke. Traditional venous thromboembolic events, well described in terms of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. But also this new phenomenon of immunothrombosis, which seems to manifest principally in the smaller vessels of the lung, but also in other organs. There has been a legislative change because many of the people who are staying home and are unable to access services in hospitals previously could not access telemedicine services because the Supreme Court of India had banned it, saying that no doctor can actually prescribe a medicine unless he has examined the patient. Now, with the COVID situation, that legislation has actually been passed now, which enables telemedicine to be extended much more widely. And therefore, many of the patients with hypertension and cardiovascular disease are paradoxically benefiting in terms of their routine and chronic care from the uh, assent given to telemedicine. And this is probably likely to be a feature that will stay with our health system. I hope by the end of this talk, you'll agree with me that one of the things we're going to need to do next across all of these areas is to start to consider mental health aspects more deeply. What we're seeing is that, that COVID-19 exacerbates mental health inequalities. So we're not all in the same boat. Some of us are in super yachts and some of us are in, in small boats with one oar. And what a pandemic can do is, is have profound responses both at a physical level but at a, a mental level. Um, uh, and these boats, as it were, being pushed apart in their inequalities. So vulnerable groups, we're seeing a rise in, in mental health illness um, across countries from China initially, Italy, uh, Sweden, the UK, particularly in vulnerable groups who already have an existing mental health problem, but also tipping people towards increased levels of anxiety, common mental health problems such as anxiety and depression. I think it's true that our ability to take care of patients is improving over time. Um, I think there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost is general medical care. We're getting a, a 
greater uh, understanding of the disease process, of when and how to intubate, um, when and how to start anticoagulation, as was discussed in, in great detail earlier, um, when and what drugs to use. Um, I like to make comparisons between where we are now and, and 20, 30 years ago when we started the HIV epidemic. Um, it, it took us uh, several years to get any uh, therapies that had a sense of activity. We've accomplished that now in a couple of months. It's about access as well. So access to, to these vaccines is going to be a challenge because the rich countries are already trying to, you know, advance purchase as many different candidates as they can, because there's no certainty that any one vaccine approach is going to work. So if you have a lot of money, you, you're going to spread your bets and buy as many options as possible. That means in terms of global access, it's going to make it really uh, tough for low and middle income countries to get vaccines any time in the short period um, from discovery to rollout. And the other challenge when you think about it is, is just the sheer volume. Thinking about the UK in the first place, if we want to vaccinate the entire UK population in the first half of next year, that's never been done. So we have to be very creative about thinking about the ways vaccination strategies, mass vaccination strategies can be done. But when you think about it globally, trying to come up with an approach for 7 billion people is an enormous undertaking. And currently, the, the biggest number of vaccines that are made a year is about half a billion doses of polio vaccine. Nobody's made uh, you know, a billion doses of any vaccine globally in any single year. So many challenges, um, but hopefully a, a lot of potential success as well. Actually, unless we remember the simple messages about washing hands, wearing face masks and keeping our distance, uh, if we don't remember that, we're not going to be able to prevent the spread of this disease because however, however quickly the vaccines become available, uh, it is actually people living in poorer conditions. It is the social and health inequalities that are making this disease much worse in our poorer uh, communities. Uh, and I was very struck when listening to Srinath earlier on, Srinath Reddy, when he was talking about the need for policymakers to think about uh, the strategies to prevent non-communicable disease. This isn't just about preventing um, infectious diseases. This is about making sure our populations are more robust and able to cope with the disease should they get it. So less diabetes, less heart disease, uh, and particularly in, in our vulnerable communities. So I think our politicians need to think very hard about uh, the strategies they adopt. It is clear that even when a patient survives COVID, they are left in many cases with persistent disease. And the disease that they are left with is usually multi-system and requires the cooperation and collaboration of multiple specialists. That is the rationale for there being clinics such as we have at Mount Sinai in New York that provide for comprehensive interdisciplinary care for patients with COVID disease where there are respiratory specialists, renal specialists, mental health specialists, cardiologists, all in place so that we can handle all the different complications that persist in patients after they recover and survive from COVID. Dr. Cantor did correctly mention the uh, Spanish flu pandemic, which 100 years, by 100 years ago today, to, in, to, in 1920, was, was starting to disappear and indeed did. But left behind, what wasn't mentioned, a huge trail of neuropsychiatric complications uh, in, in the uh, encephalitis lethargica uh, epidemic, which we think probably was linked both um, in terms of movement disorders, psychiatric disorders, et cetera, which would stay around for a generation. 
and was of course so amply described by von Economo, who was a professor of both psychiatry and neurology, and we have too few of those these days. So it was also very good to hear Charles talking about the need now for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary working, um, because what we're facing now is an uphill struggle of rehabilitation of both frail and also not so frail uh, younger people developing uh, you know, uh, post-infectious fatigue syndromes, again, which I think will develop into a major issue and will provide a lot of therapeutic challenges. This is an international disease. The virus does not care which country it is in. It will behave biologically the same driven by the inter-individual factors. But what is clear is that there is a large amount of international collaboration. We heard that here today. We've all benefited from the experiences in each other's country. We've exchanged data, we've exchanged ideas, we've exchanged experiences, and I think that has advanced the care in all of our different countries. So I think we are left with a hope that when this is over, that we will emerge from this in a better place than when we were reminded of by Dr. Cantor after the Spanish flu in 2018, and we'll be left with a spirit of cooperation and collaboration and understanding we can do better together than we can each do individually. I'd like to start by uh, picking up on something that Dr. Cantor said in his uh, opening remarks, that we, we're facing a, a system or that had part of its uh, uh, key function falling off the edge of the cliff but international collaboration, a focus on biomedical research, has started to provide answers at scale and pace that have helped inform during the course of this rapidly evolving pandemic, the opportunity to intervene effectively in patients. We have to stay together in this and use also the broader definition of health that Dr. Museveni was talking about, I hope she's got home safely. Um, and of course, remember that health is a much bigger concept than just the, the sum of our systems. And she introduced the specter of the looming economic disaster that may end up doing even more damage to our mental health and our physical health than, um, and than the original virus itself. So I guess then to finish off with what Dr. Cantor said about, we have a choice, do we work together or do we work separately? And this is not just now as disciplines, but as nations. I would like to finish with a quote from because we've been so well supported by the Americans today, and delightful to have so many, but one of the greatest politicians and scientists ever, Benjamin Franklin, who reminded his colleagues that we had to, we had better hang together or we will hang separately. And I hope that we will manage to hang together because the alternative would be far worse. <laughs> <laughs>